Thank you. Well, friends, good morning. Whoa, all right. Welcome to worship. Uh, it's so good to see you. My name is Evan. I'm the pastor here. I want to welcome you to worship today on this third Sunday of Advent. We are deep in the season of Advent and very busy here at St. Paul's, but uh, excited to gather today to worship the Lord together. To begin announcements this morning, I'm going to invite uh, our youth and family director, Melissa, to come and to share them with us. Good morning. We have many announcements for you. Uh, I know the pastor has some special ones. I will save those for the end. Uh, we have our Christmas services, just so you know, they are posted in your bulletin. Next week, we have our 10 a.m. combined service. Then we have our 5 p.m. family service. 7.30 and 11 will both be candlelight services for your Christmas Eve things. Just so you know, it is correct in your bulletin, but if you were looking at the announcements before, there is Sunday school today. So the children after children's sermon uh, will be able to go to uh, well actually after they sing because some of them are singing but uh, they will be able to go to Sunday school there is Sunday school today but there will not be Sunday school next Sunday or the Sunday after that because both of those services will be uh, 10 a.m. one-time services so just to give you a heads up on that this week we have some special things for you I want to let you know that our midweek service we're combining with a family idea we're gonna have some uh, Chris special Christmas carols and then uh, Mike Jensen's gonna give us a slight message on um, Charlie Brown Christmas and a little bit of history on Charles Schultz and the TV program and then we'll be showing the Charlie Brown Christmas movie so if you're interested and you just want to have a fun night out it's a little bit of a lesson and then uh, a nice time out uh, to watch Charlie Brown Christmas and then uh, we have other things. We have our King and Country streaming concert. That'll happen here. 7 p.m. we'll have snacks uh, in the youth room. And then the concert will be in here showing on the big screen. And it'll be streamed live from the King and Country concert. Uh, it'll be another great night if you want to come out, hear some great carols, sing along, and praise the Lord. So that is uh, December 22nd at 7 p.m. And then coming up in January, we already book in our January calendar. Uh, back by popular demand, we're going to have country line dancing. Uh, it's going to be uh, January 13th from 7 to 9. Uh, you can see Tony DeBona if you would like some more information. Okay, and then uh, I know Pete has one announcement, and then the pastor will finish our announcements. Good morning, St. Paul's. If you don't know, I'm the president of um, United Methodist Men. And I would like to announce that our tree sales is fully complete. We have sold out all of our trees, and we're very thankful. Thank you all. <laughs> we have four or five trees that are still in the pen. If anybody is still in dire need of a tree, it's there. Just go and take it. It's, we're, we're, you can have it. They're not the best of trees, but it's a tree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to re I want to just remind you, we've been announcing it, but on Thursday, uh, December 21st at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we're going to have a Blue Christmas service. If Blue Christmas services are unfamiliar to you, that's a, a, a service during this season where we have a lots of talk of merriment and joy and uh, jolliness, and yet for many folks, it's a season of sadness and grief. And so this is a, a service to be able to bring that into the presence of God. Uh, there'll be music, there'll be scripture, there'll be a reflection and a time for you to come. Um, it'll have a tree here and, and, and we'll have some ornaments here or you can bring one from home. Um, and that ornament can uh, symbolize what you need to bring into God's presence. And you'll have a time to come and to put that up on a tree that will be in here uh, for that service. So that is Thursday at 7 o'clock. Uh, also, there are connect cards in your pews and prayer cards. If you want to connect with the ministries of our church or submit a prayer request, please fill those out and put those in the offering plate when our offering is taken. Last night was our first, I know, our first night of the cantata. Uh, it was a wonderful time. I want to thank... Uh, all who made it possible, you're going to get a couple little, little tastes of it today. Um, and so I know it's going to whet your appetite for more. So please come out uh, tonight. And you know, this week I had a visit from a very special elf um, who is going to offer us a little uh, insight into the cantata. This is oh. Lisa, what do you want to do? 
yeah. So if you, if you want to see that oversized elf play bells tonight, please come out at 7 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. Tony, we love you. Well, friends, I invite you to unite your hearts in prayer and worship as we listen to our bells offer our prelude this morning. Will you please join me in an opening word of prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for this time you bring us together. We thank you, Lord, for the season that we are in here in Advent, that we are able to celebrate you with absolute joy. Joy, Lord, comes in many forms. We can even find joy, Lord, in times when we feel trial and tribulation. We know that joy comes from you, Lord, the hope we find in you, the peace we find in you, Lord. We find it all within you. Let us feel it in joy in our hearts, even if in our season we are not always in the happiest of places. But if we find happiness, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that blessing as well. Please bless our service, Lord, today. Bless our time together. We lift this up in your holy and precious name. Amen. Please join us for our first hymn of praise, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. This is found in your red hymnal on 206. It will also be on the screen behind me. Please stand as you are able.
family to come forward as we light our Advent wreath, which we do each week, these four weeks of the season of Advent, and we remember an aspect of the coming of Christ, both his first and his second coming. So I invite you to follow along. The responsive reading will be on the screen. Advent is a time to awaken our spiritual senses. Grant us vision to behold your glory. Quiet us so we may hear your still, soft voice. In awe of your deeds, Lord, repeat them in our day. Make us vessels of your mercy, compassion, and grace. For all of us eagerly watching for your glory in our midst.
This morning, we light three candles. The first candle reminds us of those who find themselves in a season of waiting, resting in hopeful anticipation for God to act. The second candle is for anyone feeling weakened and wearied by the circumstances of life. We echo the cry of scripture to renew their strength and increase their power. The third candle awakens our spiritual senses, challenging us to embrace the glory of God as we await our Savior's promised coming. Okay. There, hello. Hello. Good morning. All right. We're going to have the kids come up. Once the choir comes, you know, guys, I'm going to actually have you come sit up here so I can actually stand. Yeah. You get to stand and sit on the risers. Ooh, it's exciting. Everybody's excited. There we go. They're up high so you can see them. There we go. Okay. Hi. You want to come sit on the risers? Yeah, no, look at them all on the top row. There we go. Okay. Hello. Hi, everybody. Are we excited about Christmas? Yes, Christmas makes us happy, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. So we've gone over Advent. So, guys, let's look at the Advent wreath over here, right? So the first candle on our first week was what word? What word did the first candle represent? I know you know. What is it? Joy? No. What? <laughs> hope. Hope. The hope. Thank goodness. Okay. Second word it was last week. Okay. See it? Peace. Yes. Peace. And this week we have joy. This week we have joy. Thank you. Yes. This week is joy. So that is where we are at now. Now, I want you to think about something for me. What brings you joy? Do you have any examples of something that you think brings you joy? Shooting my brother with a Nerf gun? Uh, I'm not going to go with physical violence, but sure. Getting the, getting the victory royale in Fortnite. Okay. Playing with my cats. Playing with your cats? Okay, that can bring joy. Animals, sure. Playing Roblox? Playing, okay, so the playing is, is definitely like a theme here. We like things that bring us joy, right? But I just want to like highlight joy for you guys. Now, in Scripture, I looked this up in a certain version of the Bible, which is ESV, which is the English Standard Version, a version a lot of people read. How many times do you think joy or joyous or joyful is mentioned in the Bible? How many times do you think it's mentioned? I'll let you do guesses. What do you think? Like in the 200s? Mm, it's actually higher than that. 500. A little lower. Okay, hold on. I'm going to go to hands I haven't seen. 450. That is so close. Okay. No. Okay. I'll, right here, I'm going to let you do my last guess. Four, 440. So close. 430 times. So joy is mentioned in the Bible, the whole Bible, 430 times. How many times do you think the word happiness is mentioned in the English Standard Version? Hold on. I want to see a hand I haven't seen. All these hands I've seen, I'm just going to make sure. Um, 450. Nope. Much lower. Zero. Not zero, but, but, but again. Melinda? Uh, like the 200? Nope. I'm going to tell you. It's 10 times. So... 
joy, uh, yeah, right? So joy is mentioned 430 times. Happiness, happiness is only mentioned 10, yeah? Only 10 times. Oh, 10 times 10, no, it is just, I understand. So only 10 only 10 places in the Bible, in, at least in the English Standard Version, is it said happiness. Because joy, guys, represents a lot more than happiness. Okay, we have scripture, which I'm going to share with you guys. Hold on, there we go. We have, okay, so guys, in Proverbs, which is Old Testament, a joyful heart is good medicine. That comes from Proverbs 17.22. Okay, so it's good medicine. We have in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. The first one is love, but the second one is joy. So that's something that we have. And then it says in James, count it joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. So you know what joy also comes in? When we're in trouble. When we're in trouble, where do we go? Where should we go if we're in trouble? Who should we go to? Say it loud, say it proud. God. There we go. We should go to God. God is there for us in times of trouble. We can find joy even in times of trouble, okay? So not just happiness, but joy. All right, you guys, are you ready to pray with me? Okay, are you ready? All right, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for all kinds of joy you give us. We thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift you gave us, which is your sacrifice for us. Amen. All right, guys, you can go to Sunday school. Let's stand and greet one another this morning. Good morning, let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have made. Dear God, in this Advent season, we celebrate that you are not hidden from us. Instead, you chose to be with us here on earth. Lord, as we are busy with shopping, parties, visiting, and checking off our lists, <coughs> excuse me, uh, please keep us grounded in the real reason for this celebration, the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, it is because of your words that we have hope and faith. You tell us in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, Lord, we pray to you boldly for an end to violence and persecution of innocents throughout the world and a universal understanding of goodwill towards all. Heavenly Father, we take this time to bring to you our private prayers. Lord, now we pray the, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Bill, for leading us in prayer this morning. I'm going to invite our ushers to come this morning as we receive our offering. Our choir will come for our special music during the offering.
I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing our doxology this morning. Loving God, we thank you for loving us. And in gratitude, we offer back these gifts to your service in our world. May they bring the joy of Jesus to those both near and far. For we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for our hymn, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies. It's in your red hymnal on page 173, and it's on the screen. to come and share our scripture readings this morning. Anne? The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. It's on page 1157 in your pew Bible. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, 
to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the splendor, for the glory of his splendor. They will re rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd their flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will be acknowledged that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before the nations. The second reading is from the New Testament, the book of John, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28 on page 1646 in your pew Bible. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together this morning. Loving and gracious God, on a Sunday where we talk about joy, some of us may not feel very joyful. Lord, remind us of who you are and what we can find in your presence. And Lord, may we become people of joy. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever felt longing? You longed for someone or something. Is that a familiar feeling to any of you? You felt that. Maybe it's, um, you know, something like today, I long for the New York Giants to win. <laughs> we still have a chance. Maybe you long for uh, a meal that you like, or you long for this or that thing. Good things in themselves, but... As much as I'd love to see the Giants win, this is not a thing of huge consequence. But there are things that we long for that are big and important, isn't it? Maybe it's the longing for the 
the restoration of a relationship or someone's healing. Maybe it's a longing to see a loved one again. Maybe it's the longing for a child to call home. Someone to be free from whatever it is that holds them down. Maybe it's a longing to go back in time and to say something differently or to do something a different way. We know that feeling, don't we? That pulls at our hearts. That feeling of longing. If we can get in touch with that feeling just a little bit, we might start to understand how the people in Jesus' day felt about the Messiah. Oh, you see it all through the prophets, this language, this yearning, this longing for things to be made right, for injustices to be righted, for God's mercy to rain down, for goodness, for flourishing, for grace and love to define human relationships. That is a fundamental piece of all the prophets is a real longing. You know, because in, in the prophet's day, in Jesus' day, all down through history to our day, most of us, if we examine our hearts, we know that the world around us isn't quite right. St. Augustine, the great doctor of the church, said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. You see, all of us are made at our deepest level. It's how we're fashioned and created. We long for something. Beyond human relationships, beyond this world, we long for something deeper, something good, something right. And we see all around us every day people in pursuit of doing something about that feeling, don't we? Is it any wonder that rates of depression and anxiety are on the rise? Substance abuse, addiction rates, people who are more connected than ever before through technology, and yet we have the highest rates of loneliness that have ever been recorded. All of us feel this sense of longing. And the question for us today is, then what are you doing to fill it up? What are you reaching for? What are you pursuing to satiate the yearning that you and that I, that all of us have, that marks the human experience? What do we do with that longing? In Jesus' day, they longed for the Messiah. And the prophets longed for the Messiah, and they told of the Messiah, and the people longed for the Messiah, because they understood that the Messiah wasn't just an ordinary, everyday person, a, a mighty ruler, someone who had, you know, um, great skills in battle, or someone with political acumen. They understood the Messiah to be God himself, who would step into human history, and who would love and care for his people in a way that no earthly ruler could. The people longed for that. They felt it in their bones. And imagine, if you will, with me, this man. We, we, we painted the picture, didn't we, last week? This guy who lives out in the desert. He wears camel hair. He eats locusts. And there was a resounding yum from the people of God here at St. Paul's when they heard that he ate locusts and wild honey. You long for that diet. And here he was living out in the wilderness, preaching and baptizing people and preparing them. And in this figure of John the Baptist, we find all of the Old Testament prophets kind of find their completion in this man whose sole purpose it is to prepare the way for someone who's coming. 
That John the Baptist in the Gospel of John, we have another peek into this uh, enigmatic figure. You know, in the Gospels, there's not a whole lot that's recorded of him. We have a little bit that the, at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he prepares the way. We see uh, Mary and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, have this beautiful interaction in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and then we have John's arrest and his beheading by Herod. But other than that, we have very little about John. And I think that's just how John would have wanted it. Because John's whole life was not about himself. His whole life, remember the picture last week? It was the finger pointing towards someone else. So his sole purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus. And he shows up in the Gospel of John today, and the Gospel writer records this, that you know John the Baptist came, and there was a lot of confusion about who this man was. You see, in Jesus' day, there was this expectation that Elijah himself would come back. He was considered one of the greatest of the prophets. And if you remember, uh, in the Old Testament, he's what? Taken up into heaven in a chariot. He doesn't die, and so there was this expectation that he would return, that he would come back. And so where there's this fellow who's out in the, in the desert, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's baptizing which is something that only happened in the temple. It was a rite of purification, and, and it, it happened in the temple. But here's John with locust uh, wings and antennas stuck in his teeth, honey dripping down his face, out of the temple, taking these rituals and rites from the temple out to the people. And he's baptizing them to prepare them for someone who's coming. Yeah. And so the good religious leaders get their hackles up. Because that's what happens with good religious leaders, isn't it? When they see things happening in a way that they don't like, or that goes against the rule book, they come out and they start to question this guy. What are you doing? Who do you think you are? Are you, are you Elijah? No. Are you another one of the prophets? No. Then who are you? In other words, I think we can read that as who do you think you are? And he says, I'm just the voice of someone crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. And then, I don't want us to miss this one phrase in the Gospel of John that he records. When they're asking him about who he is and what he's doing, John says, there's someone, there's someone Standing among you. And you don't even know who it is. You can't even see him. It's not that they couldn't see him. You know what I mean. They couldn't see him. And he said, I'm not even worthy to get down and to undo his sandals. And this is a man, John the Baptist, that Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, that he was, there was no greater man born among women. Yes. So if John the Baptist... The greatest of all men born among women is not worthy to untie his sandals. What kind of man is this? This sandal-wearing man. Here's the thing in the ancient world. Undoing sandals, that was the job of the lowliest slave. Because, you know, let's, let's be real. Feet are grouse. Okay? Uh, in the ancient world and today, feet are just kind of disgusting. But in the ancient world, you know, they didn't have the nice lotions you could put on your feet. These disciples weren't going out getting pedicures. They didn't have that cool file that you could take the callus off your heel with. They didn't have any of that. These were stinky, dirty feet. And so you had the lowest of the slaves deal with the feet. People would come into a house, they'd come into the temple, and you would have slaves there whose their job it was to undo the sandals, to bathe the feet, to wash the feet, to make them clean, and then the person could be about their business. And John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to be the lowest of the low. You see, friends, the Gospels, in ways both explicit and implied, are always telling us something about Jesus. And who he is. And how important he is. And John the Baptist, this great man, this great prophet, the one who bridges the old and the new. 
the one who Jesus says is the greatest born, says, I'm not even worthy to be the lowest slave for this man. We see all through the scriptures that relate to John the Baptist that he had a longing, but coupled with that longing for the Messiah was this realization that the Messiah had come. And John the Baptist pointed everyone to this man who could fill the deepest longing in their heart. The man in whom they're yearning for a new world and a new way, for God's justice and righteousness, completely fulfilled in this man. The man where longing and reality and promise meet. So what does that mean for us? What's the so what? How should we live then in light of this? Yes, Jesus is important. Yes, we're supposed to, in a sense, be like John the Baptist and point others to him. But, you know, in the hecticness and the busyness of our lives and everything to which we must attend and those longings that all of us still do feel for things to be made right, what does it mean to live in light of the first coming of the Messiah and in anticipation of a second. What's that word you see on the screen? Joy. And we're not talking about our beautiful, wonderful administrative assistant <laughs> who shares that great name. Joy. As with most good biblical words, it's been totally stripped of its power and force. We've talked about that a lot during Advent, haven't we? Because we, we talk about words like hope and peace and love and joy. All these words that are so easily bandied about, that are on our lips all the time. And yet when we come to Scripture, they're so rich and so full and nuanced. And often have a meaning that's completely divorced from the way that we use them in our everyday language. If you and I were to talk about joy or being joyful or rejoicing... Oh, we might, uh, you know, today when, when the Giants win, I might rejoice. If you have um, something that happens in your life, you feel joy. You see someone you haven't seen in a while. You hear a beautiful piece of music. You read a, a, a novel that you love. You might feel some sense of joy. It's not what the Bible means by joy. You see, the Bible says these enigmatic, very strange things about joy. I mean, how can the Apostle Paul, imprisoned in Rome, say, rejoice always? And again, I say what? Rejoice. rejoice. Here's a clue. In the Bible, when the biblical author repeats something, he really, really wants you to understand it. Rejoice always. And again, I say, rejoice. And here's a man who is shackled in a dirty, dank Roman prison. How in the world can he say that? The prophet Isaiah in the 61st chapter, who's writing in the diaspora. The people of God have been taken captive. They're displaced from their homeland. And he talks about joy and delight in God. How is that possible? When the people of God are led in the exodus out of Egypt into the wilderness, what's one of the very first things they do before they start a long litany of complaints? But that's another sermon. Before that, what do they do? They rejoice. They're filled with joy. You know, in the Bible, there are different words in the Hebrew and the Greek used for joy. They have a different nuance, a different meaning. Like we might talk about, you know, contentment or happiness or joy or fulfillment. All words that might get at an aspect of joy. It's the same in the biblical languages. There are different words used for joy. One of the most common, most prevalent ways to talk about joy in the Bible is a sense of contentment and fulfillment that is completely divorced, completely, uh, totally not dependent on one's circumstances. You see, for us so often, isn't that how we measure joy? Joy when we're feeling well. Joy when we're in good health. Joy when we have a lot of money in the bank account. 
Joy when our friends and our family are around us. Joy when our sports team is doing well. Or, or joy when our particular candidate gets elected. All these circumstances that we look to, and we, say, we, we define joy by that. And yet Scripture is totally different. It says joy doesn't depend on any of that. All of those things could happen, or none of those things could happen. And you and I can still be joyful. Why? How, you say? Because joy is a sense of promise. Hope. That there is one who loves us and who is with us despite the circumstances. There is one who accepts us and loves us regardless of what we have done. There is someone who loves us even when we can't love ourselves. You see, Implied in joy, implied in joy is a confident trust in the one who can give joy, and that is God. So that's why Paul can say, even while he's in prison, rejoice always. Because it doesn't matter where you are or what is happening to you, because God is good all the time, and God loves us regardless of what is happening around us. And John the Baptist, even when he's in prison, totally set up. And when Herod goes and has him beheaded, all through those narratives you find someone totally at peace. Why? Because he knew the man to whom he pointed. And friends, that is the only way that you and I can have joy, a sense of contentment, a nourishment of that longing in our soul, a relief for that yearning, when we look past the finger of John the Baptist to the man to whom he pointed. And when we know that man, we can have joy at all times, in all places, and in all things. Because the source of our joy is not anything around us. The source of our joy is God himself. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You'll find it in your hymnal on page 240 and on the screen.
and sisters, may the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.